we are pleased to welcome Reverend Dr. Alexander G. back to the Kingdom Justice Summit. Dr. G. serves as the lead pastor of Fountain of Life Church and is the founder and president of the Nehemiah Center for Urban Development. Dr. G. has been a community influencer and cross-cultural team builder for over three decades. Dr. G. was the 1994 recipient of the City of Madison's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award. His op-ed piece in the Cap Times in 2013 positioned him as a renowned thought leader regarding strategic and cross-cultural relationships. Dr. G. is a social entrepreneur, adjunct faculty member, author of two books, and the host of the Wisconsin Podcast Association's favorite podcast of 2020, Black Like Me. Please join us in welcoming Reverend Dr. Alexander G. I want to talk to you about hope today, but before I do that, I want to frame it by telling a story, and it gives you some insight into my family. When I was a kid, I was not allowed to play with anyone who said my sister Laleda wasn't welcome. Um, If I had new friends, they're new to the community, and they said, hey, come over, but your little sister can't come. If my sister went home and told my mom that I went someplace she couldn't go, I would be in trouble, painful trouble. Um, And my mom had two reasons for doing this. One is that she didn't want to let people think that they could divide our family. Second thing was, She wanted me to question, how could someone really love or respect me if they didn't love and respect someone who was closest and related to me? You know, as I think about this, um, my sister was a shy, awkward kid uh, plagued by years of sexual trauma and sexual abuse. But she had this hope that I would never go somewhere she couldn't go or have access to something that she didn't have access to. She didn't have it. We didn't have it. And if I had it, we had it. And I want to use that to frame our discussion about hope today. Um, hope is one of those somewhat ethereal words that we, 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 we toss out. We confuse it with um, faith. You know, faith is really based upon no or little evidence. But um, hope is more an emotion. It's, it's, it's hoping that at some point something could take place. It's an expectation. Whereas hope really is rooted in my heart. And we believe that it's done right now, done deal, and it's settled. But I want to look at hope in two different ways. But before, before doing that, I want to read a passage um, from Hebrews uh, 6. And it's talking about this hope that we have in Christ, that um, God wanted to prove that God was not a liar and offered us affirmation and confirmation of this truth. And this truth is so secure that uh, Hebrews six nineteen says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure, this hope being Christ. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so this passage is talking about the fact that we have hope in Jesus. And so is hope now? Is hope to come? Is hope historic? How do we frame hope? And that's what I want to take a look at. I believe that there are two hopes at least. One is rooted in eschatology, which is really the study of the theology of end things. It's death, it's judgment, it's eternity. But then also I want to root it in ecclesiology, and that is the mission of the church, the role of the church and its ability to either affirm or to move away from the mission of of Christ. And so I want to look at those two things. But because of God's grace to us through Christ, we have both an eschatological hope in the sweet by and by, we have that. Um, hence songs that were very, very important in my black church tradition. Songs like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming to Take Me Home. If you listen to older black gospel, there, were all, there was always the refrain of, I'm going to a place where I can sing and shout. If there's anybody black in the room, they'd finish it for me. I'm go- there'll be nobody there to put me out. I'm going to a place where I can sit down. I'm going to a place where I can tell Jesus all about my troubles. Because there was a sense that you could not sit down in this life. There was a sense that nothing was carrying you to a better place in this life. And there was a sense that you couldn't really tell many people about your struggles. But in this eschatological hope that one day we'd be in the presence of sweet Jesus who would welcome us um, and free us from our struggles. 
and we loved that. And so we aimed for that. We, we tended to our work. We endured the hardship of everyday life because in the sweet by and by, Jesus was going to come or call and take us home. But the extent to which we had an ecclesiastical hope was interesting. It means that we really are our brothers and sisters keepers, that we believe to one in one another, um, that we have each other's backs. It, it's why the Lord set up systems like gleaning or care for the widows or care for the orphans or the, for the foreigners or the outsiders, because the family of God was known for having its family back. But historically, my people, black folks, oppressed people, could only hold to the eschatological sense of hope because society, including the church, didn't see them as equal or of any humane value. So let me just tell you a little bit about the progress of our ecclesiastical faith. First, we were savage. It's why people came to Africa to get us in order to bring us to Christ, really to bring us to free labor. Um, um, I won't go there. That's, a, that's another conference, another talk. Um, and then the process was conversion, maybe, because there was a huge debate can these folks really be saved? Do they have a soul? Because if they think they have access to God, they might not want to work hard. And then if it was certain that conversion could be um, um, conferred upon us, then the question was baptism. Maybe because then that makes them the part of the family. Will they want to be equal, marry our children? Um, communion was a question. If they are converted and if they are baptized, can they have communion? And in the early days, when we were offered communion, it was with this stipulation. Swear on the body of Christ, you will not seek freedom. Thereby making freedom or the search for freedom blasphemous. Leaving my ancestors who were people of faith in a quandary. Do I want freedom, humanity for which Christ died? Or do I do I? Do I choose just to, to be a heretic and just choose eternal damnation? Are the two um, mutually exclusive? Can I be free and in Christ? At the communion table of the early church, they couldn't. Then black preachers were hired to travel in the circuit and to tell the slaves, servants, obey your masters. So then after that process, baptism, communion, conversion, all right, you can come to church with us, but you have to stand in that balcony where it's probably 116 degrees because we're talking about the South. And being tired of standing there, black people then created their own places of worship. But before they did that, they would steal away in the secret midnight to what black folks called the brush harbor or the hush harbors, where they would sneak out and at midnight under the twilight would pray to Jesus and they would catch the Holy Ghost. And I would read, I'm reading, I've read this in secular accounts. This is not any accounts of church historians. This is in the account of academicians, historians saying that they would rock back and forth and they would yell out Jesus so that the others at the prayer meeting would cover their mouths because if it were found out that they were praying, they would be killed. No, we didn't have ecclesiological sense of hope, except for those who would risk their lives to go out to the fields and pray in the middle of the night and then get up and take care of somebody else's fields and somebody else's babies and someone else's livestock. So in Luke 7, 22, when John's disciples were asking Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one that we've been looking for? Jesus says, yeah, yeah, go back and tell John, because Jesus has been doing these tremendous miracles. Go back and tell John that the blind are receiving the sight, the lame are walking, people are being healed from leprosy, the deaf are being healed. Oh, and tell him that the poor have the gospel that's preached to them. Is the church still the bride of Christ? Is Christ divorced from us? thereby canceling our mandate to preach the gospel to the poor? Does Christ have two wives? Is Christ a divorcee? Is he a bigamist? Is he not the husband of the oppressed church? So then is Christ a fornicator? Because he is certainly intimate with us. What's the state of Jesus? As people will say, in my community, the devil is a lie. Christ is Christ and has one bride, the church of Jesus Christ. I consider myself um, a historian. And so I love this story about um, a local pastor. Years ago, this pastor suffered pushback after following God's heart to really reach out to um, unreached kids. This pastor said that God had given him a vision, and this was in the early 70s, to reach out to the black community and help black children come to faith. And so not only was he committed to doing that, he realized that his church was located in an area that kids who would come from that from the neighborhood they were trying to reach, didn't really have access. They'd have to catch several buses on a Sunday. 
So he arranged to have what's called the happy bus, several of them, to go into the south side of Madison and not just show up and pick kids up like a weird cult, but he sent evangelists in on Saturdays to knock on the doors of the homes of black children and invite the parents, talk to the parents about Jesus and about faith and invite them to come to their church. And if the parents were unwilling or uninterested um, in coming, they would then ask, well, can we pick your child up tomorrow? But every Saturday, they would evangelize the parents in order to make sure that the child was coming that Sunday. Well, there was all kinds of pushback on that process. And there are people that were really upset that these children from this community were coming to their church. But three of the passengers, children on that bus, became pastors in the city. In fact, they are three of the longest serving pastors in this community, of which I'm one. And we would come to Sunday school and then we'd have our snacks and then we'd get back on the bus and go back to the south side. But one Sunday there was a delay in getting on the bus and the children were lining up. And I remember for whatever reason, I think we had a presentation to the broader church. So they brought the children upstairs and the other kids went back down for their snacks and I stayed upstairs. And I remember the pastor, strong, strong, tall, slim, stately man with a strong Southern um, accent drawl. And I remember him quoting John three sixteen. And as a kid, I might've been seven or eight years old. That passage riveted me. At the time, I didn't know why. I could still remember the sanctuary. I can remember where I was sitting and his voice and that system booming for God so loved the world. Um, I'm sorry that the pushback caused him to not finish his tenure at that church. And he was willing to pay that price for injustice. And I am the result of that ministry and everything I touch and everything I do. And those two other pastors, I led them to faith when we were in middle school. It's my sister and it was my best friend, David. And it makes me realize that not only did they say that there was a gap or gulf between us and them, they created a system to bring us in through the bus system. You know, any person who's hungry for God's heart for justice will look around to see who's left out and try to make room for them at the table. Anyone who's truly hungry for the heart of God will look to see who's not here and then make room and say, scoot over. Hey, we've got a space right here. That's what that pastor did for me. Maybe he was pushed out or maybe he gladly left because he didn't want to be any place where his brothers and sisters couldn't come and pray and worship. Proverbs 11 and one talks about God's disdain for dishonest scales. That's really talking about systemic biases, systemic injustice, because God's not saying I hate butchers, but rather I hate the dishonest systems of measurement or the scales that promotes two outcomes, one fair, one unfair, one to insiders and one to the other. That it is so easy that, that sometimes our fear, our faith, I'm sorry, has this, this slim veneer that we think that God just hates the scale, but it was plural. I hate your unjust scales. I hate your system because regardless of who the butcher is, it will still benefit some while proving a disadvantage to others. But God used strong language. And this is more than just dishonesty. It is the system of dishonesty that doesn't even let you know you're being dishonest. And so if you're being told when this group of people come in, use the blue button on the scale, and you don't even know why you're pushing the blue button, but when this group comes, push the yellow button, you don't even understand that you're, you're causing um, a disadvantage to one group because it is so embedded in the system. It's not the scale that it is evil, and it's not even the one pushing the button on the scale that is evil necessarily, but it's the one who programmed the scale so that even when they are not there, it still benefits some. It robs some and not the other. So if we're really going to focus on justice, and if I'm asked, honestly, what does justice look like in this community in which we live, it means that you've got to, we've got to address the dishonest systems, and we know they're there. But if we fix them, it means equality for everyone. We might not really want that. Sometimes I wanted to play with that cool friend, and I didn't care that they thought that my sister was awkward. I wanted to be accepted. And so sometimes I put my own interest in front of what was right, 
because of how it benefited me. So if we're going to really face systems of injustice, it means that we've got to fix some things and we might not get all of the benefits we used to give. If we're going to address dishonest systems, that means sometimes you might fix it with a new butcher. Sometimes you might fix it with a new scale. Or sometimes you need a different market. You just need a whole new place to shop. In Acts chapter 6, when the Greek widows complained that they were being mistreated, and I'm assuming it's true because the apostles addressed it, they adjusted the scales. They didn't tell them, stop being victims. Get over it. Pull yourselves up by your bootstrap. Work hard like we did. You should have been born over here instead of way out there. You should have been closer to the temple. Rather than attacking them or calling them victims, they adjusted the system. It makes me wonder, didn't the apostles see this hypocrisy? Come on. I mean, didn't they realize that the Hellenistic widows weren't being served the same way? Did they have to wait for them to say, ouch, in order to fix something that was broken? Well, they said, ouch, and they did fix it. And they brought leaders with Greek names to serve the Hellenist widows. The ugliness of a system is that it makes you blind when it's justice that should be blind. How do we become blind to injustice when fairness and justice should be blind? A new system was the result. New leaders were chosen to ensure that justice would take place. I want to come back to something I said just a moment ago. These women were not deemed as victims, nor the seven leaders who were chosen to serve them. Some days I wonder, do we make it tough to make people speak up and speak out against injustice because we belittle them further, accuse them further by saying, if you can't make it in a system that was skewed against you in design, and now that you're going to acknowledge that it exists and you're going to say something about it and challenge those of us who benefit from it, well, we just think you're a victim. We just think you have issues. We just think you're weak-minded. Why don't you read your Bible more? Why don't you just work harder? The reason why God hates these balances that are, that are dishonest, because it doesn't make any difference how hard you work. It doesn't make any difference whether you buy your meat, buy your lamb in the morning or at night or in the evening. The scale is still jilted. The system is still rigged. They fixed it. They addressed it. And then the church grew. God responded by growing the church and adding more to it. I don't think God allows the church to grow when people are truly stewing in victimization. And the last I read, Scripture speaks more to and against oppressors than it does the over-victimization of individuals, if we're just talking scripture. We see in scripture that God gave Peter a new scale also. The God of Israel had shown up to this Gentile named Cornelius and said, through, spoke through an angel and said, God has seen your good work, your alms, and, and God wants to bless you and your family. Well, then God of Israel appears to Peter who walked with Christ, walked on the water, all this stuff, and said, Peter, got, a, got something I want you to do. And then he lets down this blanket and offers Peter his food. And Peter says, I ain't eating that. You know, I'm not putting that in my mouth. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Hebrew's Hebrew. I'm not, I'm not going to do this. And God says, you know, Peter, you've got a lot of nerve calling something unclean that I've called clean, that you have devalued something that I value. You know, our scales must be synchronized with heaven's estimation of people, groups, situations that folks find themselves in. And the church has got to be about finding ways to bring people in, dismantling the injustice. We're not called just to make sandwiches. We're called to fix the scales that slices the meat so that people can make better, fair, and more affordable sandwiches. That that's the role of the church. So some days, no, I don't have an ecclesiological hope. And I'm not always sure that Jesus does either as long as we continue to walk in our ways. You know, what's interesting to me is that this ecclesiological hope seems to be brimming and running rampant. Um, and this is where I do have hope. 
So I don't want you to, to, to just back away and say, did this man just say he has no hope? But where my hope does seem to be rising is that there seems to be this, uh, this, this communal hope in places of where the church is persecuted, underground, otherwise oppressed, places around the world that we call third world, in slums, places I visited in, 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 in Asia, in India, and even in the inner cities, places I visited and have had a chance to preach. But the broader church doesn't always seem willing or interested in learning from these congregations. The ugliness of injustice is that it allows others to devalue those who have been oppressed by the very systems that empowers another group of people. And that when those folks are oppressed, they seem to be disposable. What can you tell me about Jesus? What can you tell me about hope? Where is your theology? Where, where is the theology in your songs or your missions or your work? But where the church is brimming and where folks are coming to Christ and where the joy is exciting and where it has not been overly politicized is in the underground church, the persecuted church, the inner city church, the churches in the barrios where they have nothing but Jesus. Somewhere in this talk, there's going to be a photo of my grandmother's church back in the late 40s. And my grandmother was a single mom, four children, never been married. Each child had a different last name because each child had a different father. She contracted tuberculosis, and a doctor told her that it would be just a matter of time before she died. She went to a prayer meeting, and there was a woman who couldn't preach because she was a woman. She couldn't vote because she was black, couldn't own property because she was poor. But she laid hands on my grandmother. My grandmother was instantly healed. And as a result, my mother became a Christian. I was my Sunday school teacher. I became a Christian. I'm a pastor today. My grandmother helped to plant the church that I pastored. When I moved into full-time ministry, she put my first robe on me as I stepped into um, owning and experiencing that mantle. But she almost died. But a church full of sharecroppers said, I don't think so. And this woman who could have been put out of many churches, many circles, because she, four kids in the 40s, never been married, but they took her and became family. When she did marry in that church, moved to Chicago to find a better life for her family, that church watched my grandmother's children, my mother, my aunt, my uncles, and became family to them. They didn't have equipment like this. They didn't have buses like the Happy Bus, but they had Jesus. In those cornrows, they had Jesus. In that hot sun in southeast Missouri, they had Jesus. In, in society, they were told, no, 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 you can't vote. But they believed that they could get on their knees and have access to and an audience with Jesus, that they could go beyond the veil that Hebrews 6 talks about. I want to be a part of an ecclesiological church that offers that kind of hope. Kingdom justice isn't an exercise or an activity. Justice is what the kingdom exists for. And like Jesus' message to John's followers in Luke 7, if the gospel hasn't yet preached, been preached to or liberated the poor, then the kingdom hasn't come and his will is not being done. The ugliness of injustice is that those who profit from it and refuse to dismantle it only do so because they have forgotten or ignored the grace of God to them. Justice puts everyone right at God, the oppressor and the oppressed when it happens. Justice is about justice. It's not about pitying the poor or giving someone a leg up to beat you in a race. Like the unrepentant debtor in scripture who was forgiven but wouldn't forgive his own debtors. Or the rich man who ignored Lazarus just to find out that Lazarus had something that he could have shared with the rich man had the rich man only stooped to have a sandwich with him or a piece of bread with him, that justice could have spared him the damnation he was experiencing when he called for Lazarus. Oh, we found out he actually knew his name to dip his fingers in cool water and touch his tongue. I'm good with Jesus. I believe in the hereafter. And I believe that because of what he did at Calvary, I've got a great eschatological faith. I'm good. However, the Bible says that humanity will recognize Christ's lordship among us if we love each other and practice an ecclesiological hope. I want that. I don't always have hope that that'll take place, 
But I'm hoping like forums like this, the Kingdom Justice Summit, and our pulpits, and people gathering to really be the true church will turn that. This broken world needs an ecclesiological hope to see brothers and sisters working together. Because if we do that, they will know that we are Christ's disciples and will have a gauge on Christ, which is key to an eschatological hope. That it is in finding Christ and following Christ and being found of Christ that we have an eternal hope. I want to take a moment and pray for us that we will be brothers and sisters to each other and also the bride to Christ, that the world may see our ecclesiological love and understand that Christ is real. And it's only evident, not mostly evident, only evident when we love each other. And when we love each other, we dismantle the unjust scales. We put ourselves in harm's way to let others in at the table. And we refuse to support anything that tells our younger siblings, you're not allowed to come here. Lord, I ask you for a deep hope because I'm, I know I'm not the only one who struggles in knowing that I have a hope in the sweet by and by, the swinging low or the sweet chariot and a place where I can tell you all about my troubles. That's settling my heart. My people have has recited those songs and those scriptures for 400 years. But for 400 years, we've been waiting for true ecclesiological hope where we are family and we stand together. I pray that you would give us a revival, not only in this land, but in the world, that it is rooted in true hope and true love. Please, Lord, let your kingdom come quickly and let your will be done. Amen.